Welcome back to another Inside Edition of Eat My Shorts. Today we'll talk about surplus firearms and why they're prolific. Continuing on with the series about proliferation of small arms. So after a major conflict, what happens is the outdated technology, once it's deemed obsolescent or obsolete, becomes available, traditionally at least, in the surplus market, which is people like you and me right, or, or militaries in third world nations or police departments or other such entities and government agencies. And it's given out as aid, too, sometimes, military aid. We'll come back to that point here in a minute and why it's relevant. So how the process works, from what I understand, is the military adopts a new thing and they run it to the ground. And when they decide, you know what, we want a new, new thing, how are we going to pay for this? Well, let's let's get rid of the old thing, and that way we can afford the new thing when we take taxpayers' money and squander it. Hey, there's an idea. Now, the state of the surplus, I, I've done a video on this and about how abysmal the surplus market is right now. There's a reason why. There is a ongoing conflict in Europe right now that shall not be named. We all know which one it is. And it's been going on since 2014. Well, that's about the same time that the price of surplus firearms went through the roof. There's a reason why. Because during a fear of a conflict, or a global conflict, or during a pretty substantial conflict, which this little mess has turned out to be now, there becomes a large amount of panic buying. Yes, they do it overseas too. They have decided that, hey, it's time to dust out the old moist nugget. It's time to dust out the rusty, trusty SKS and AKs. All these surplus Makarovs and Tokarevs and everything else, they're still being used. Same for the PPSHs and PPDs and RPKs and PKMs and everything else. All that shit is being used right now. It's mothballed Soviet technology. Now, you got to remember that just about every country outside the United States, although we did domestically produce the Mosin just about every country in Middle East, Asia, most of Europe, and um, even not like Iran and Iraq, still use the moist nugget, the old Mosin Nagant, right? And that rifle was invented in 1891. Uh, a lot of them were made by Westinghouse and Remington and things like that. And they use an obsolete cartridge that is 7.62 by 54R, or in the Finns' case, 53R, which is the same ammunition with tighter specs. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, anytime you see a large shift of weaponry, and funds going someplace. It's a real good fucking indicator of how the market's going to go, right? You see American manufactured ammunition turning up overseas. You're seeing American manufactured firearms too, not just American pattern firearms like American manufactured com block pattern firearms ending up overseas right now, like right fucking now, okay? So... What we're doing is something called Lend-Lease, or, or some variation thereof. It's basically where we say, look, we'll supply you with your weapons. We'll supply you with your ammunition, your supplies, your food, everything. You're going to pay us a premium on this if and when you win this conflict. And that's how they make their money, right? War is an economy, okay? So what life lessons does this have for us? Basically... What's going to happen is these older pattern firearms that become surplus are no longer going to become available. So it's a potential markup, right? So if you, for example, are sitting on a huge pile of these Cold War era weapons that were sitting around and the demand keeps going up and up and up and up and the price keeps going up and up and up and up and you would like to, let's say, upgrade to modern gear if you want to, you know, might be time to think about trading up. You know, especially if you're interested in the whole being prepared thing, you know, you probably want to have some NATO caliber firearms around. You know, it's 9mm, 
556 by 45 millimeter, which is your AR-15 stuff, like in 223. You know, 762 by 51 or 308. You know, things like that. You know, it doesn't hurt, right? Because as cool and iconic as those Soviet pattern firearms are, especially AKs, you know, I, I some of my first firearms were Cold War surplus guns. You know, I still adore them to this day. Do I have any? No. The price has just gone up. But if you're wanting to be prepared and to really, really get into this whole idea of the, the Minuteman mentalities and all these other ideas being thrown around, um, you know, you, you can see what the market's doing and you can see the large transfer of small arms and going on everywhere. And it's not just Ukraine and Russia that this stuff's happening to. Like, all of the countries surrounding it are being inundated and flooded with both new and old technology right now in preparation for the potential of things escalating or because there's just a market for it. You know, so imagine what would happen here, right? Say if there was trouble. Now, this is another reason why I have a beef with this whole sky is falling thing. If the sky was really falling right now, why would you be able to go to the store and buy any firearm you want for almost nothing? Think about that. There won't be any at the store. Same for ammunition, right? So as bad as things sound every day when we turn on the news, we have to remember, watch the transfer of small arms and ammunition and where it's going. That's a real big indicator of where trouble's going to pop off, and that's kind of where I'll leave you for uh, this third installment on proliferation 